Greetings adventurers, and welcome back to the Sanctum Sanctorum of the Dungeon Master Supreme. Today, we're going to have our episode on the Dungeon Master's Toolbox. Basically, what are the tools you need to run a successful session, stay prepared, stay organized, and keep things rolling smoothly. Basically, every time you pause, have to flip a page, look for something, the longer that goes on, the less immersed your players are the less they're enjoying it and the less you have time to enjoy it as well. Because it's that experience of being caught up in the adventure and that reality and that fantasy world that's gonna bring the fun. That's where that all comes from. So the less you have to do rules looks up, looking up rules, uh, figuring out you know names of NPCs, towns, things like that. And that's where I always say um, I love existing in theater of mind and no matter how uh, online and digital and every nuance or out there with the miniatures and everything always leave room for some imagination some improvisation some just making it up and pulling it out of your butt as you go but the key thing I, I make my toolbox out of is my laptop now you might have a dungeon master screen a notebook a binder something else to work with a tablet versus a PC, you know, that, a laptop. Um, whatever works for you is what you should go with. If you're not a computer person or that just doesn't work for you, don't use it. If it's distracting, something you fumble with, that's not what's gonna help. It's whatever makes it quick and easy. So, like I said, I load up my my laptop and I open up my browser and I set up uh, online tabs of all kinds of different tools. You know, one of the first things I, I load up is an online dice roller. Something that can, you know, I've got mine that does, you know, two, six, eight, ten, twelve, all the way up to a hundred. So I can just quickly roll you know, uh, one shot dice, or I've got another thing where right below it, that lets me roll, put in 12 D six or 12 D eight real quick and roll that. And it's going to tell me what the median is so I can get a gauge of, you know, Oh my God, I just rolled in the 90th percentile. I'm going to hit these guys with something a little bit high. Let me just take the median roll and let them hit them a little less. So I don't TPK the party. You know, you might make that decision or you might go, I rolled really low and I wanted this shot to really hurt them. Let's roll, let's give them that median amount or a little bit higher to, to really make it hurt. You know, whatever works for you, you know, never be afraid to fudge your rolls. That's also what having it behind your screen or rolling your dice uh, behind your screen works. You know, my players, when I roll my dice physically, they are always looking and, you know, I've got my laptop up almost like a DM screen. There's stuff, but they're still able to see around. So the there is nothing um, more helpful than them not knowing what you're rolling and why. You know, just randomly rolling some dice can start getting them thinking. And then they start talking and then you can use that as your own thing. Because Another tool to put in your toolbox is your players themselves. When they met a game, when they talk, when they think, oh, that's a cool idea, or this might be a cool thing, you know, even when it's just discussing of what they might want to do in a town, you know, they decide to go one way, but they, they said three or four ideas that were pretty interesting. You can workshop those later, you know, make a little note of those and workshop them later to, you know, go, hey, they're going to go into this town. That'd be a great spot to put one of these ideas in. Uh, especially when they talk about it in reference to their character and really start adding backstory elements and things like that that are more immersive. And what they talk about can help you be like, I'm the evil DM, you've given me ideas. Because <laughs> that silence and sitting back and letting your players feed you ideas or letting their own paranoia give you ideas is great. There's a great... Um, trap that's based on this. Basically, your players go into a room, the door behind them locks, a clock starts on the wall, and there's a button in the middle. And every time they hit that button, the clock resets. Now all they have to do is let the clock run down and the door opens and they walk out of the room. 
But they're worried about that clock and what it means to run down. And that button. So their very own paranoia can leave them trapped in the room. And you can add elements to this and make it more interesting in other ways. But let their imaginations run your game. I have always like to think of it as don't don't railroad your players let them railroad themselves you know you're the conductor on this train it's the crazy train let them railroad themselves they are some of your best tools now add to that you know we've talked to dice roller we've talked uh, your players to give you great ideas another thing is auto tables you look in the back of the Dungeon Master's Guide, you know, you, you've got tables for rolling magic items, treasure, uh, you know, you can get NPC names, towns, and there's other books that have come out with 5th edition that really help with this. Uh, I think in the back of Xanatars, you, you've got a whole range on backstory buildup that you can uh, build up, or that might be Volos, I'm not really sure which book it is, but in the back of some of the first books they were putting out, they, they had, you know, roll one to a hundred and, you know, this is your character's name. This is your character's backstory. This is your character's uh, this or that. You know, are their parents alive or, you know, a thousand and one things. You got characters that have hard time building a backstory, hand them an auto roll sheet. Uh, easily copied out of the back of the book or give them the book to, to use that way. Do the same thing with yourself with building NPCs, dungeons, cities even. Uh, the John's Tools Online, uh, get a link in there in the description or something. They have every kind of great um, auto roller with treasure and taverns and inns and things like that that you can roll up. They'll give you ideas like, what's on the menu? I mean, you think about this, you know, you go, oh, there's a tavern, it's blah, 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 you set it up. You thought of everything, and then you go, well, what does it serve for food? And you're like, oh, so what do they serve? What does it cost? It's already on there. You can just, uh, ready-made NPCs on there. So that's a great one. Um, there's also an auto tables uh, rolling thing that I've, I found. That's also a good one. I'll include that link in the description. But those auto tables can, automatic roll tables can just make things so much easier. You're like, you'll know if it's not the right fit and roll again, you know, and you'll be able to build stuff up a lot quicker in preparation as well as right there at the table. Once again, keep it moving. Then let's see what else you got to get. You have to keep your nose clear, you know, whether you're detailed and you've mapped out every nuance of the world in a thousand different ways, or you've got little scribbled two sentence notes on everything. It does not matter. You need a good organization system. And that's where I think the best organization system for your notes is OneNote from Microsoft. You can access it online. Uh, if you're a Windows person, you may already have this. It is a great note taking uh, and organization strategy. And there are a thousand videos on YouTube showing you uh, detailing how great this is as an organization system and how to use it even better. There are people out there that have already put together OneNote references with all the monsters, spells, magic items, things like that. So you don't even have to take the time to build up that kind of note taking. But you can also use it as your dungeon master screen where all those little references to, well, how big is a giant? How old is a dragon when he gets to a certain size? You know, uh, what are the, you know, potion, potion of healing. Most common one for me. You know, 44 plus 2 for a potion of healing. 8d4 plus 4 for greater. And, you know, I'm not sure of the rest. So I gotta look. You know, those are things that your players want to know. Also, when you're reading incapacitated versus grappled, restrained, exhaustion, level one, two, three, 
those are hard to keep in mind necessarily, those conditions. So I have that reference there. Easy peasy. It's just a click away. And you can keep yourself really organized. You can put the whole adventure module from something in there and look at the reference notes for that. So you've got the map for uh, a different town in the Tyranny of Dragons or uh, any other kind of module. Lost Lines of Flandrevar or whatever came with the intro. There is another aspect to this I love keeping track of what my players, you know, name, backstory, level, um, if they've died and how they died, you know, what major scars or traumas, you know, might have come up with that, you know, did they lose an ear or did you impose something in last session that needs to keep going that you need to have, you know, set up so you know to reference that. Uh, ongoing to remind them of that you know they've got minus five to their charisma because their ear got sliced off by that goblin they decided to keep poking you know whatever it might be there's a thousand and one things that you can make little player notes that'd be like huh you they said this in their backstory that'd be an interesting way to twist that around or something they said you know let's play it that way and, and take it in a whole different direction than they thought when they came up with this you know, these are kind of things that you can get in there and really give yourself uh, a, a robust uh, resource to really like pull out information that you don't have to memorize, but really helps keep the game going. Your player's stats alone can be helpful. Knowing, you know, what how many magic slots they should have from last session, what their hit points were at, knowing their AC just off it by itself can speed up combat so much. You roll the dice, you know that, oh, that's 18, that's a hit on you. You know, you don't even have to ask them, what's your AC? Because I guarantee you, if you're anything like me, you'll forget that sometimes in the middle of a game. Uh, if you got a note right there that says AC's 17, you know that. Spell save DC is the same way, you know, and there's times where you want to roll things and no uh, passive perceptions and, and passive kind of ability takes where like, hmm, let's see, would they notice this or would they understand this? Do I need to give them a little extra information off this based on their stats or their abilities or, you know, their history here? You know, that's a good way to, like, roll that dice at an odd time that they don't know why you're rolling and it actually has meaning and consequence, but it's not, oh, the evil leech is about to spring their trap, or, oh, what did they step on? <laughs> that kind of thing. Now, you've got your auto-roll tables. you got your online dice roller. you got your note-taping with uh, uh, one note. Another thing is, no matter if you're running... Um, you know, theater of the mind, having little uh, visual aids, maps can be really helpful, particularly like for very key combat points. You know, they're going to get into a fight here. This is going to be the big bad boss battle. Print out a map that get, has roughly the dimension mentions of that space it looks like it or draw it out or whatever you want to do so that they can have an idea that you know from here to here is 20 feet or something like that it really will help them when they're 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 trying to visualize everything and and go with this and you're trying to you might have some specific spells or traps or things like that you need to know are they in range of and they don't you don't need to be like measuring that out on the table or things like that Excuse me. Another thing is all those little things that like might come their way. Property deeds, uh, rest warrants, letters. You can print these things out and hand it to somebody. You, you found this on their body. You can share that with everybody. You can keep it. You can burn it. It might be a rest warrant uh, for them for murder, rape, sedition. You know, and it's true, you know, the party doesn't know. Or it might be revealing some secret information or history they don't want anyone to know about them. 
you know, there's all kinds of things that these little aids can do and they can add nuance and mystery to your, your game. The same thing with miniatures. And I know miniatures can be an expensive and irritating process, but there are a lot of paper miniatures, you know, things you can just print out, cut out, fold up real quick and have an army of goblins or have, you know, 10, 15 hobgoblins, orcs, whatever you need for a big combat. And especially with bigger monsters, you know, dragon, ancient dragons and uh, Demogorgon and whatnot that they're massive figures. They cost $100, $200 to get an uh, unpainted, decent one, you know, when you don't have access to a 3D printer or something like that. Ink and paper, relatively cheap, especially if you uh, buy your printer like I did based off uh, searches for cheap ink that's compatible with your printer. That's what I did. I get my ink for $13 uh, for all of it, color and black, and works great. So keep that in mind, you know, when you're when you're going, I'd love to have miniatures, but they're so expensive. A $10, $15 laminator, five, six bucks of lamination sheets, uh, paper cutter, your printer, you put it all together, that, things that you might already have, and you can be printing out miniatures by the hordes um, with almost no time or effort committed. And it's not going to be expensive where, you know, it could be two bucks for an unpainted miniature, whereas you could get a colored paper uh, mini that will stand up and your players will love for like 20 cents. No, it's, it's up to you on how you do that, but it can be really good. Another aspect to set these kind of things that enhance the experience is ambiance. Do not underestimate the value of having music. Just background music that fits the, the scene. And this can be, you know, you might think it's difficult to find the right thing or switch between, but you can create a playlist off YouTube and, and play one or off your phone and, and things like that and just switch between them. There's other, also the, I, option of using software, my absolute recommendation, the best one out there is Sirenscape. Now, if Sirenscape wants to sponsor me, that's great, but they are not sponsoring this. This is a completely heartfelt recommendation. They they offer a great software. One, it's easy, it's specific. You can set it up to any scenario you have from, you know, fantasy to horror to, uh, science fiction, whatever. And they've got something there and for free. Now they, they have paid software, but they have several free options that are fully functional software. It's not free trial BS or, you know, we're gonna mess with you all the time with ads and things like that. It's really user friendly. It's just basic stuff. It's not all the options and bells and whistles they have. And they have a lot. So once you get in there and you start using it, you might want to put in, invest that money in extra sounds and things like that that really interest you in integrating that into your, your gameplay. Once you, once you download that free software and start using it and get the idea of having them go into a tavern and there be those tavern sounds, setting up the sounds for a bar fight if they get into a little tussle, having, you know, uh, sounds for like an evil shopkeeper's shop or uh, battles against a dragon or an army of orcs or something like that can be just mind-blowingly more fun. Let's see, what else would be on the tools list here for you? Uh, you know, uh, oh, I'm, think, I'm messing up here. But regardless, uh, you, you personally, you the DM, are your greatest tool. Like I said, improvisation, imagination, how to apply ambiance, these miniatures, maps, 
what you might create in that regard, those things are going to bring you the best reaction out of your players. Giving your uh, best in your NPCs. Try, you know, if you can do voices, do voices. Or at least do an accent if you can on some things. I try to put a Scottish brogue on uh, uh, ogres all the time and make them kind of fun, crude uh, idiots, basically, in um, my game. And the reality of it is it doesn't work out necessarily fantastic. That's mainly because I can't keep it consistent, but... You can do what you can, you know, in terms of that, you know, uh, just nuance, uh, you know, you, your description alone, you know, they have a scar, they have, they're missing some teeth, they're, they talk with a lisp because of those missing teeth, or they're, there's a certain hiss in their way of saying, you know, and these can hint at other things that you want, uh, your players to guess at or maybe figure out about a player, especially if they jump to a conclusion. You know, orcs are usually the bad guy. You know, you, you've you got a, some players that are murder hobos. Have them come across an orc, blade out, dripping blood, injured merchant laying against his ruined wagon, dead bodies strewn about of humans, and he looks like he's ready to slit this merchant's throat with his spear, let him attack him. Turns out he's a high-level monk from a monastery of orcs and half-orcs that have gave their life from escaping the violence and cruelty of traditional orc life. And he mops the floor with them. You know, high-level open-hand monk can stun, go invisible, Hit them down, and you throw in a magic item or two on this guy. It can teach them a lesson that's very valuable about making assumptions about who they attack and way they evaluate things. This is the power you have. You know, it's the power to say, you know, the rule normally says this, but I'm going to let you do it anyways. This one time. Or I'll let you do it from now on. You know, it's the power to say, you know, that was really great in character. I'm going to give you advantage on your next roll. Or you can have advantage anytime you feel like it. You know, here's a d20. You roll that uh, with anything else you want to roll if you, if you don't get a good roll. You know, it's things like that that can really boost morale. It can really get people invested in their characters and keep moving forward. Uh, with this and that's part of what you want you know one of the best parts about being a DM is to create this world but if the players don't want to show up every week or every other week or however frequently you get set up that's a problem because you can't do uh, D&D without the players and I can't do it without you but if you're not committed to bringing your best to it they're not going to do the same so you and your players are some of your best tools and maybe the only tools you need. So I'm gonna end that there for your toolbox. I'm sure I've missed a few things. There are other people out there that talk about game prep, game tools, and they've got some great advice as well. Look for those people, like them, subscribe to them. Please do the same. Let's worship the Yogg. Give that thumbs up. Give that subscribe and ring those bells. Call us all to service next time I have a video up. If you're feeling especially generous, head over to my Patreon page and uh, become a patron. That will be awesome. Like I said, every dollar you invest in me is a dollar I can put back into this channel in some way or some fashion. So thank you for your time. Thank you for coming to the Sanctum Sanctorum, and good adventure.